Hey guys, welcome in. This is your lecture for Monday, March 30th. I uh, hope you enjoyed the weekend. Um, I know that uh, I spent most of Saturday evening bailing, bailing water out of a basement, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, but I hope you were able to enjoy the weekend. Um, let's dive right in. Uh, let's talk about congressional interactions. Let's talk about the way a bill gets passed. Um, this is in coordination with the reading and the questions that were posted for you um, on uh, Friday. So let's dive in. All right. As we go through this process, we're going to walk through the process of how a bill becomes a law, what the role of, of the legislative branch of Congress is uh, in passing a bill uh, into law. So um, <clears throat> if you need help, I include this handy little clip from the West Wing. Um, it is probably uh, a good opportunity for you to catch up on the West Wing during this extended time off. It is available for you on Netflix. I know that I've checked out a couple of episodes while we've been off too, so please, this gets my full endorsement. Absolutely watch the West Wing if you're if you're interested in politics, if you're inter interested in government. All right, so how a bill becomes a law. Um, we're gonna, for the sake of this of this example, we're gonna introduce a bill uh, first uh, in the House of Representatives. Um, if it gets introduced in the Senate, which is a little less common than it being introduced in the House, uh, it basically basically works the same way, uh, except for the House portion and the Senate portion would be flipped. Uh, but for the sake of for the sake of argument, um, a bill is going to be formally submitted. It's going to be formally authored by a sponsor. That person must be a member of Congress. So uh, it, if the bill is originally the idea of some kind of interest group or some sort of um, political action committee uh, or, or some organization outside of government, that's fine. Uh, but the bill has to be formally written and or formally submitted rather by a sponsor that is a member of Congress. Most bills are going to have co-sponsors. It is extremely infrequent or unlikely uh, that you will see a bill submitted or debated um, that is only sponsored by one person. Almost, they almost always have multiple sponsors and co-sponsors. They're absolutely going to receive assistance from lobbyists, uh, from political action committees, from interest groups, from all kinds of different uh, different people uh, in putting together the bill. It is extremely beneficial if you know um, when you submit the bill that it has some some level of bipartisan support, right? If you know that as a Republican you have some Democrats that are willing to support um, your bill, uh, that's going to be extremely beneficial and ve very um, useful in getting the bill passed or signed into law. Uh, in some cases, um, sponsors of bills will look for bipartisan support and they will make uh, members of both parties co-sponsors on the bill in order to demonstrate just how much bi bipartisan support a particular bill has. The only exception to where bills are going to be introduced is, is going to be with tax-related bills. All tax-related bills must be introduced in the House of Representatives. It's a power specifically designated for the House of Representatives in the Articles of Confederation. Uh, the reason The reason being... Uh, clearly, clearly laid out um, that as a bigger group uh, and the group that is more representative of the common people uh, under the way that the Constitution is originally constructed, tax bills should be should be introduced there. They should be um, first debated there as, as opposed to being debated in the Senate, which early on tended to be a little bit more upper class, tended to be a little bit more wealthy uh, and, and not all that in tune with the financial needs or the financial um issues facing everyday American citizens. Uh, the second the second thing that's going to happen to a bill after it's introduced is it's going to be pushed into a standing committee. Uh, and this is where most bills die. About 99% of the bills that are introduced in Congress uh, die in standing committee. There's going to be a member of Congress who specializes in that policy area uh, that's going to act as the chair of that standing committee in most cases, and, and that bill is going to be directed into a standing committee into a standing committee by the speaker. So under the current context, under the current structure, uh, Nancy Pelosi basically has full full authority to direct each bill to whichever standing committee she wants. When they reach a standing committee, they are oftentimes pushed even further down the list into, into what's called a subcommittee, uh, which is typically just a small group of people from that committee that are going to look into... Um, Look into the bill, investigate the bill, figure out, okay, does it do what it actually intends to do? Um, does it help the way that it intends to help? How much is it going to cost? Where is that money coming from? All of those questions are going to be things that are investigated uh, while a bill is in committee. Standing committees can, after they've, after they've investigated the bill, report back favorably. They can report back unfavorably, or they can pigeonhole it. If they pigeonhole it, basically what we mean when we say pigeonhole is that the bill gets stuck in committee. The chairman of the committee um, never asks for a vote. They never actually ask the committee to decide whether they view the, the bill favorably or unfavorably. Um, so if 
if a member of Congress uh, proposes a bill, submits authors or sorry, sponsors a bill, and it ends up in committee, um, and the Speaker of the House or the Chairman of that committee really just don't want to ever see that have this thing see the light of light of day. What they'll do is they'll pigeonhole it and they'll basically just leave it stuck in committee um, for eternity, essentially. Um, so those are really the three options that they have that are the most normal. And then the, the fourth one is kind of getting into this this discussion about marking it up. And basically this is the, okay, we like this part. We don't like this part. If we change this piece over here, um, then we're more okay with it. If, if you take this part out, we, we can potentially be on board, but that markup committee or that markup part of a bill being in committee is a pretty significant piece. Um, if it gets marked up to the point uh, that it, it really doesn't resemble the original bill, sometimes what that that c committee will do is they'll actually just subcommit or substitute a new bill. Um, they'll basically say, you know what, this might have been the start of a good idea, but there's too much too much junk in here. There's too much stuff that we don't want to deal with in the original bill, so we're actually going to substitute a new one. We're going to write a new one instead. From that point, the bill is going to go to the Rules Committee, and the Rules Committee, again, again, is going to act as kind of the traffic cop for the House debate. Basically, they're going to decide, okay, when this thing reaches the entire House of Representatives, when the all 435 members um, have the opportunity to discuss, to debate, and to talk about this bill in the chamber, what are the rules for debate going to be? Is it going to be a closed rule? Is it going, where we have strict time limits? Debate must be relevant at all times, and there are no amendments allowed. There, you cannot add anything to the to the bill if it is a closed rule debate. If it's going to be an open rule debate, again, this is a decision made by the rules committee in the House. The time limits are a lot looser. Typically, um, the debate is going to be a lot a lot more open, and it allows for amendments to be added. R those are frequently referred to as writers. Uh, they're kind of what we're talking about when we talk about pork barreling. These are the things that get added onto bills that seem to be unrelated. Right? If you're trying to pass if you're trying to pass a bill uh, having to do with the preservation of national parks and all of a sudden you see funding for, I don't know, military spending added, typically that was a writer that was added as part of an open rule debate uh, in the House of Representatives. Um, but the, the Rules Committee is going to set the rules for debate when this when that bill finally shows up in front of all 435 members. Uh, eventually, the House is going to have that debate and there's going to be a, there's going to be a vote. Again, the rules are set by the Rules Committee before the deb debate begins, basically di dictating how much time uh, members have to speak in front of their colleagues about their position, about their opinion, about why they think people should or should not support the bill. Uh, they do not have to use all of their time. Uh, and in fact, a lot of times uh, you'll see people yield some of their time. And basically uh, what they do when they're yielding their time is they're saying, listen, I don't have a ton of expertise or knowledge about this particular subject area, um, but I don't just want to throw out my five, six, seven minutes either. So they'll yield their time. Maybe they'll yield two, three, four minutes of their time um, to the person that sponsored the bill, to somebody that they trust um, that kind of supports the bill the same way, supports or objects this, the bill for the same reasons they do. Um, but in a lot of cases, um, you'll see that take place that way. The people that are really the most knowledgeable or have the strongest opinions about a bill are doing the bulk of the debating in the house. <coughs> Excuse me. In order for a vote to take place, they need to have what's called quorum, meaning they need to have a majority of the members of the house present. Uh, since we have 435 members uh, in the House of Representatives, 218 of them must be present in order for a debate to take place. If we don't have 218, if we don't have quorum, uh, we aren't even allowed to debate a bill. We absolutely cannot vote on a bill, but debate is not even allowed at that point. The only kind of weird little exception to that is what's called a committee of the whole, uh, where 100, 100 members of the House are selected uh, to conduct official bu official business. Um, we'll get into some of the whys on why the com a committee of the whole might be useful um, down the road here in the next couple of days. Well, if that bill receives a majority of the votes in the House of Representatives and it is passed through the House, that's when it goes to the Senate. Okay, when it's when it's introduced in the Senate, there are a few differences, not a ton. There's going to be an informal debate since there is no Senate Rules Committee. Um, time limits are not a thing. Debate is unlimited. It does not have to be relevant at all times. You can see possible filibusters going on. Um, and writers are absolutely going to be possible. You'll see this thing get port or at have pork added to it in the, during the pork barreling process during the uh, debate in the Senate in some cases. 
in the Senate, you need a majority of the votes to pass a bill. 51 obviously is a majority, uh, but really um, you're going to need 60. Uh, you're going to need 60 to ensure that if if somebody from the opposing side tries to start a filibuster, you have the necessary votes to file a cloture motion, to pass a cloture motion, and to force a, a vote in the Senate. Um, so yes, while you only need 51 to pass a bill, you're actually going to want 60 if you're trying to pass a bill, because if you don't have 60, uh, the opposition can filibuster for an undetermined amount of time. They can filibuster for as long as they want. So if you really want to get it passed, 60 votes are necessary in the Senate. So that's kind of the process in the House. That's the process in the Senate. Even at that point, though, even if the House is, has voted yes, a majority of members of the House voted yes for a bill, even if a, a majority of members have voted yes for a bill in the Senate, we still are not even close to done yet. Uh, at that point, it needs to go to what's called a conference committee. Uh, and a conference committee is going to be members of both the House and the Senate. Uh, and they're going to come together and they're going to say, okay, the bill that we passed in the House, some of the writers that were added, some of the amendments that were added, were are, are a little bit different than some of the amendments that were added in the Senate. The amendments need to be exactly the same on both versions of the bill before it, before it is considered approved by the legislative branch. So members to this conference committee are going to be appointed by leadership. They're going to be appointed in the House of Representatives uh, by Speaker Pelosi, they're going to be there's going to be uh, input from the majority leader, the minority leader, the whips in both parties, and the same is going to be true in the Senate. Um, the President of the Senate, uh, Senator Grassley, as well as uh, Majority Leader McConnell um, and his team, as well as uh, Minority Leader Schumer and his team, they're all going to be a part of appointing which members of their respective houses serve in that conference committee. But if the members from the House and the conference or and the and the Senate are not able to reach a compromise if they are not able to look at all of the amendments that have been authored on are offered on both sides and find a compromise on them. The bill is dead. They have to agree to the same version of the bill if they're able to reach a compromise, which is certainly cer certainly tricky in some cases. That bill goes back to the House and back to the Senate for another vote. So they, the House and the Senate have already voted yes on this bill, but then the conference committee got involved and basically determined a compromised version of the bill, and the House and the Senate have to approve it again. A lot of times that conference committee, committee is where you're going to see pork added. You're going to see pork barrel amendments added and tacked onto this thing in the conference committee stage. Yes, they're tacked on during the debate on either floor, but really the bigger opportunity for pork is during the conference committee uh, portion of this process. If they go back to the House and the Senate and they still both vote yes uh, on the compromised version of the bill, that's where they go to the president's desk. The president has 10 days to decide. He can sign the bill into law. He can veto it. If he vetoes it, he's essentially just saying, I forbid it. Um, and this notion that it's a stamp that he puts on there that says veto, I don't know where that started. That is not true. Um, but if he does veto it, Congress can override the veto. Or he can do nothing. If he just sits it in his pocket, it's basically called a pocket veto. He refused to sign it into law, uh, but he refused he refused to actually put his name on it and and veto it either. Uh, this pocket veto is a lot of times done in cases where a president doesn't specifically support uh, a bill, but he also knows that if he vetoes it, Congress is going to override his veto. So in that case, he'll just do nothing. He'll put the bill in his pocket or in his desk or wherever he's going to put it, uh, and, and he'll just kind of let the clock run out. After 10 days, that bill becomes law with or without the president's signature. Um, in the case of a veto, Congress can't override, obviously. Uh, they're going to need two-thirds in both houses to override a presidential veto. That is not um, two-thirds of the total right? That's not two thirds out of the 535 total members. No, actually that is going to be uh, two thirds in both individual houses, right? So you're going to need um, 67, 67 senators and you're going to need um, 290 uh, members of the House of Representatives. You're going to need two thirds of the members in the House and two thirds of the members in the Senate uh, to override a presidential veto. But in that case, once one of those things has happened, we really kind of come to the conclusion, especially if, if he, the president chooses option number one and signs the bill into law. 
in the event that he does so, um, and you'll see this whether you're looking at uh, pictures of President Obama or you go back, you know, 50, 60, 70 years and you see president or pictures of President Eisenhower or Truman or even go back to Roosevelt, um, or even if you look at more modern pictures of President Trump, there's always almost always a whole host uh, of pens that get used in order to sign a bill into law. Uh, I, I've attached, I've linked a very... Um, interesting article about why that takes place uh, on this slide. Feel free to check it out if, you, if you're if you're interested. For reference, and these are older numbers, but these are these are fairly consistent. Um, in the 110th Congress, this is going to be during President George W. Bush's time as President of the United States, uh, we saw about 6,500 bills introduced in total and 430 of them were signed into law. So this process uh, of how a bill becomes a law is something that is kind of consistently ongoing. It is continuous uh, because only about five to eight percent normally uh, of bills introduced by Congress get signed into law. So um, it definitely filters out. The process filters out a lot of the a lot of the junk, a lot of the crap um, that some sometimes kind of makes its way into the United States Congress. You're going to want to be familiar with that process, particularly uh, as we move forward, uh, particularly if you are taking the AP test in May. Uh, this is going to be a pretty significant process that you need to be familiar with. If you have questions, please send me an email about that. Uh, I would I would be more than happy to explain it further as necessary. Oh, here's the thing from Mr. Wiss's room. If you don't remember, I'm sure he showed you the I'm Just a Bill video way back when you were in junior high. I attached it just for nostalgia purposes. Uh, there is a remix if you're into that flavor. Um, so lawmakers, how do they decide whether or not they're going to support a bill? If you're a member of the House of Representatives, if you're a member of the Senate, how do you decide whether or not to vote yes or to vote no? Uh, the first thing you're going to want to consider is your constituents, right? Um, if you live in you know, rural Arkansas, and there is a gun bill um, up for debate, and it is proposing more gun control. I would imagine your constituents probably want you to vote no. They want they want as few as few gun laws. They want as li limited gun control as they can possibly get. So you're going to want to consider your constituents uh, when considering how to vote. You're going to want to consider what leadership wants. What does the what do the leaders of your party want? Um, if you're a Republican right now, you're probably going to be considering. Okay, what does the president? What does the president think about this bill? Um, what does Mitch McConnell think about this bill? What does um, Kevin McCarthy think about this bill? The people that are in those leadership positions in the Republican Party, how do they feel about this bill? It is probably something you should consider before deciding how to cast your vote. You should probably consider your colleagues. You should probably take into consideration that if you're going to want support for a bill down the road, you might want to support a bill that they're working on now, right? Maybe you do or don't care about deforestation. Uh, if it's something that matters to you, great. But if you live in New York City, I would imagine that deforestation is not really something that's very high on your priority list. But if you support a bill that limits deforestation and it helps out a good buddy of yours that lives in Washington, Maybe that same that same congressman from Washington will be willing to help you on a bill that you need assistance with down the road. So it's something to consider is, hey, is there any way that I can earn a favor that I can use later to help support something that I'm promoting or that I've authored? Support. What do your other supporters think, whether that be interest groups, political action committees, organizations, whatever? What's their opinion? You know, if, if you're a congressman that gets sizable campaign to know, uh, donations from an interest group, you're probably going to want to take them into consideration uh, before casting your vote on a particular bill. Staff. What does your staff think? Uh, typically, the staff of a congressman is going to be much more um, interactive uh, with constituents. They're going to be the people that are actually taking the phone calls uh, from members of your congressional districts, taking phone calls from people back at home. They're going to be the ones that are actually talking to all of these different parties. So you're going to want to consult with your staff before casting your vote. All right. Powers that Congress has over other branches. There's a whole host of them. We've gone over this checks and balances process a little, several times already throughout the school year. So I'm going to rip through these pretty quickly. First, Congress has the power of the purse, as we've denoted already. Uh, Congress makes almost all decisions when it comes to federal spending. They confirm presidential nominees. So yes, the president has the authority uh, to nominate people for positions, but ultimately all of those nominees have to be confirmed by Congress. They have oversight power, uh, whether that be on the executive branch uh, or on executive agencies, maybe the State Department, uh, the Defense Department, the Agricultural Department, 
Congress ultimately has oversight uh, on all of those different parts of the executive branch. So they, there is there is yet another check on their power. They have the authority to ratify treaties. This is probably most most clearly evidenced uh, by the end of World War One. President Wilson is pushing very hard for the peace treaty, for the creation of the League of Nations, uh, and Congress simply refuses to cave uh, on ratifying that treaty. So it is a significant, or it has been at least in the past, a significant power uh, or significant advantage that Congress, our legislative branch, has held over our executive branch. The impeachment process, you've seen that most recently with President Trump. Uh, we saw it back in the 90s with President Clinton. Um, but Congress ultimately is going to be responsible for the for the impeachment process. The actual impeachment part um, is going to take place in the House of Representatives, uh, and the trial itself is going to take place in the Senate. And maybe most significantly, um, Congress ultimately holds the authority to declare war. Between the power of the purse and Congress's authority to declare war, uh, those are probably the two best examples of the true strength of our legislative branch. Right? They have no no two bigger powers than those two um, because that really uh, dictates so much of what the government is working on and working towards when you consider their ability to dictate financing uh, of projects, the way that we spend money, and our ability to interact militarily uh, around the world. I know it was a lot. I know I ripped through it quickly. Uh, please make sure that you have read the the reading that was posted uh, on Friday as well, um, and make sure that you have completed the assignment that is due uh, on Monday also. Uh, if you have any questions about any of this, if you have any questions about the reading, you have questions about the assignment, uh, please send me an email. I'd be happy to help in any way that I can. Uh, other than that, have a good rest of your day. Uh, hopefully, we start to get some clarity on uh, over the course of the next week or so, when we might be uh, heading back to a, a little bit more normalcy. I don't know if that's any time in the immediate future, but uh, fingers crossed it is. So have a great rest of your Monday, and I will see you tomorrow.